Welcome everyone. Part three in the final discussion of 50 Years as a Low Country Witch Doctor by J.E. McTeer. Your friendly neighborhood hillbilly hoodoo sheriff voodoo whatever it is. Okay, continue here. As I said, this is a very confusing book, and uh, I will give you my full conclusion here at the end of this audio. Um, but it's a shame uh, with so many things that we have a bunch of uh, people who push themselves ahead in a particular area and declare themselves experts, um, ignoring the people in the field who really are experts because uh, they are either uneducated or lower level or just you want to cut them out and make the dough. That's what Hollywood does today. And we see this with all the ghost and paranormal shows. Um, they're really not headed by anybody of any particular value. Um, we look at the show that was taken over by Art Bell, and guess what his background is? Is he any kind of an occultist, a researcher? Has he even written a book on anything? <laughs> Nori started off making, and get this, ladies and gents, making videos for police and government agencies. How nice. Oh, isn't that a little bit of food for thought? Oh, give me a crumpet. So we know where this guy is coming from and who owns his soul. But of course, you know, they wouldn't get somebody who knew something. I mean, after all, Art Bell didn't know anything either, but people liked him. Of course, Nori's audience is about 300,000, uh, while Art Bell was more like 3 million. Um, and at least he came off a little more credible, even though um, initially um, Bell um, had his own little axe to grind as well. And uh, certainly is wouldn't be classified as anybody that really had any knowledge of the paranormal. He's just a radio guy. He's a guy from um, the Navy who learned radios there. And uh, plain and simple. And this was his qualification to talk about these areas. Uh, but was able to pull it off with some interest. Putting a bunch of wackos on there. But I mean that's part of the fun of these things. But at least he didn't start off making videos for police agencies. And um, so, and that's good enough for that particular radio show because of the fact that they are happy to have somebody who draws a teeny audience and not get a professional. And before that, they had Hilly Rose, another guy, an old radio guy that I listened to in the 70s in Los Angeles. No background whatsoever. Um, again, just putting on someone there that knows nothing, has no background, and they wonder why these shows don't really pull in the people. Of course, you got to remember Art Bell was on at a time when there was an explosion in this area. A lot of that has diminished as well. And he is back on the air, Bell, um, starting a new show. Well, whether that will ever attract the same kind of attention is unknown. Um, but it is another uh, idea of putting the unqualified in positions uh, of being self-appointed experts. I mean, what is Nori trying to portray, portray, portray himself as? What? Let's speak into the microphone. I mean, really. I mean, this guy started, you know, ran restaurants and other things. How the hell? Uh, well, we know how he got on the radio, don't we, boys and girls? <laughs> I wonder who helped him get his position. Does that rhyme with CIA or FBI? Something like that. I think it rhymes with that. So, uh, the whole idea is that um, here's another case of a guy who's portraying himself as some sort of expert for some particular reason, and we're not even sure what it was all about here. Um, another one of these uh, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants who are going to now be a voodoo expert. And, of course, uh, since he was dealing with uh, the people uh, of, in his particular area as the police... Um, this was a way to control them since uh, they were very superstitious as the uh, 
Mexican community is, and this was a way of controlling them um, by him saying what a big, giant uh, witch doctor he was, and of course claiming all the other witch doctors helped him. Of course, and uh, these were all old guys that uh, he had control over, and I'm sure threatened, and well, did threaten them. He threatened them uh, to put them in prison, and actually put a few in prison uh, for um, prescribing medicine without a license, so to speak. And um, as was covered in the other audios, uh, so uh, this was a way of his controlling these people and for others to obey him and his made-up country folk races law, which I'm sure he enforced. But uh, I tried to glean things here. Now, he has a technique, his great technique, and of course, uh, like so many authors, uh, like the all the Black Lodges, all the Satanists, um, uh, all the Temple of Setters, and they all claim they have all this secret wonderful stuff. Of course, you read their books and you find out that they're as hollow as a smoke ring and about as dense, um, and they really have nothing secret or anything else. It's a bunch of lies. Um, because you could at least hint to it or give out bids. You don't have to give it an entire system, but they never put out anything. The Temple of Set is famous for this garbage. Um, and, of course, proving and showing no power whatsoever. As is other black magic people like uh, EA, who's been arrested, who is the bottom of the barrel of what those things are, and on apparently numerous times, and um, is famous for manifesting a job as a carpet cleaner. So, I mean, this is when you look into the backgrounds of these people, this is what you get. And when you call yourself a living god, you get what you get. When you call yourself a witch doctor, uh, and this guy claims to be the most powerful um, at his time there, and then, of course, could never find anybody he could pass his knowledge on because he had nothing to pass on. <laughs> and the minute you start training somebody and announcing that they are something, uh, there becomes a problem because then the person says, well, <laughs> nothing here works and you don't know nothing. And when that gets out, then you're showed to be the fool you are. So, of course, he never could find anybody with the psychic power that he will use. And I'll use his terminology here ex uh, exactly to describe what he says. So, um... It's important to understand that. So he goes into all this and talks about this one trial with a military guy who didn't go back to the military uh, because of the fact that his root man told him that he would die. Um, he told him to get different things. So I don't know what's going on and on about this. Obviously, there's a strong belief in this. And why shouldn't there be? They certainly uh, are not. People didn't go and believe in common white society when white society did nothing but oppress them. Why would you possibly believe in that silliness? Except, of course, they forced you to do that in the church. And then, of course, what they did is just name their gods after Christian saints. Uh, but a little bit of detail of what the root man told this person to do that so that they could remove this kind of negativity or curse on them was uh, apparently this particular tradition of the root men use, don't use astrology, uh, but they use the moon and they believe all the spirits reside on the moon to the point that, and this is one of the problems of working with these people and also the reason why they didn't write things down and teach people because of the kind of level of uneducated silliness that some of these, um, that, that people have when they get too much into superstition. And um, this was a time when they were landing on the moon and one of these root master root workers said, um, was really upset because he said, you know, if people go up to the moon with the sp spirits all there, they're going to upset all the spirits and it's going to cause a lot of problems. Um, which he points out in his book, you know, everyone who has walked on the moon has gone a little bonkers. Uh, and if you listen to the different tapes and what's happened and the moonwalks and all those astronauts, they're all a little odd and strange. Uh, particularly near Armstrong, who I uh, haven't been able to confirm it, but after he came back for the moon, apparently went into a monastery. Uh, and, of course, he shut his mouth uh, right up until he died and never even said anything at his death, uh, which is typical of these 
astronauts. The little government mouthpieces they are. He also told him to go out and get graveyard dusk at midnight and uh, wash his face with a particular cream that the root man supplied him. This is very common that they use a lot of creams. This is things that are still carried on to this day of using creams or ointments uh, that have herbal essences in them. Uh, then I got a penny and she told me to uh, talk uh, to the full moon while I was uh, rubbing the penny, uh, asking it to um, remove uh, this negativity from my life. But there's a little bit of practical information there, and of course very primitive, uh, typical techniques which go into all these things. It's, it's, it's a little bit silly in common society uh, for us to kind of look at these things. and What is the energy there and what's going on? Um, and a lot of this is nonsense. The penny, the rubbing the penny, that was just is kind of a psychic tuning. You're, you're holding onto a piece of metal, a piece of copper, something that you give value to. And of course, the main thing going on here is you're you've made contact by rubbing graveyard dirt onto your face. Um, you've now connected with the spirits and ancestors of the dead, and. Um, talking to the moon, you're talking to the spirits again, both dead and alive. So that's the process that's going on there. And there, um, so, I mean, there's a reason for it and you are connecting that way. And all of these uh, Southern root men, hoodoo, voodoo traditions are um, all very much based in uh, pretty much ancestral and spirit and have a lot to do with the graveyard and using those spirits. And, you know, as um, uh, this is something that we are going to emphasize more in the guild as well as uh, using spirits uh, and not necessarily we're talking about uh, as we would define them more like a ghost, which are ancestors or dead humans to assist you. Uh, spirits are uh, as a general term, which can mean this whole class of spirit and angels, etc. But, um, you know, there has to be a, an understanding of that, and that's for another lecture. So it's very interesting that this guy risked imprisonment and all sorts of things to follow his root person. So who apparently at this point was an actually a woman. Um, so that's very interesting. Um just as a general rule to find how serious these are, but uh, if you if a bruja in the Mexican tradition was to tell someone something, I don't know if they particularly stay out of the military, but they may do something very radically if they told them that, because there's a strong belief in that. So, so this is coming more and more, and as uh, as uh, Mexican America evolves in the next ten to twenty years. Um, everybody's in for a big fucking surprise as all this not only criminality comes into the United States because all these people are run by the cartels uh, but the magic along with that and it ain't popcorn and candy magic now getting back to the practical stuff in his book in particular he talks about meeting a particular uh, witch doctor uh, on St. Helena Island which I'm assume is off of South Carolina coast there. And um, he was known as the master of light, and he guaranteed that he could produce a ball of light that everyone could see. And uh, so this is fascinating because it's always the show of power that everybody wants to see, including myself, um, which is always fascinating, but I'm more interested in the manifestation within your life, not some theatrical, even if it is real, production of some ball of light. It doesn't really do anything for me. Uh, I'm still poor, stupid, and bow-legged, and it don't help me if I see a bow of light. So I'm more uh, set on something else. But it is interesting if there is, this is a real manifestation. So he went there and he arrived at this person's house at 11 p.m. And there were um, several people there, obviously. You know, this is something that would draw probably a huge crowd today and probably get him killed. Um, then he went out to, to a... Um, 
he took everyone in their cars and he went out to a deserted stretch of road. And I think that's important to understand as well. And of course, you wouldn't want to do this in the middle of the city anyway. Next to your favorite 7-Eleven kind of would give it a, um, uh, a strange atmosphere. And everybody, of course, was getting psyched up. They talked in subdued voices. And he said, it's now 11.45 p.m. Because midnight is very important again. So we're talking about using the moon, using full moon, you know, for the practical information here. And that's what we're trying to pry out of these things. And moon magic is something we always like to use if we can through all traditional sorcery. I'm not a big fan of astrological sorcery because it's too difficult to connect thing. But even moon phases is difficult to connect with. But it's always something that you should keep in mind when doing practices. So... Um, he started then invoking spirits. Let no one talk, he stated. Falling on his knees, he started his um, supplication in an unknown tongue. So, almost like, you know, of course, these ministers do it now. They're talking in them tongues. You hear this, and that, that is not an exaggeration. You can see the TV and them talking like this, otherwise known as gibberish mental case stuff, that if you did that in the street, they'd put you in a padded room. But in a church, it's, you know, after all, it says in the Bible that, um, so he was talking some unknown tongue. We're not sure whether this was an unknown tongue or maybe some African dialect. We don't know. Uh, but apparently he was zoning out. Mostly when you do that is you're using rheumatic. As you listen to these tongue talkers, generally they're going into an altered state. It's kind of like hearing drums all the time. You're, it's, it generally tends to be very rhythmic and not speaking. Speaking in tongues would be different than actually babbling in tongues. Exactly at midnight, he stood up and stated, It's coming. Our eyes were glued on the road ahead of us. So he's doing this, and he, this ball of light will appear down the road. Okay? Um, so everybody's looking down there. A glow appeared on the edge of the woods. Interesting. Not on the road, on the edge of the woods, which I find suspicious because that's where someone could have been hiding. Uh, then approximately 150 yards from us, the glow became a bright, uh, a ball of bright light. Now, I don't know what the glow was before that, but apparently all of a sudden it got bright 150 yards, which is 450 feet. Um, it's a still a fair amount away, but uh, it's hard still at that distance to determine if this was some sort of special effect. It seemed to expand from the size of a basketball to several feet in diameter. So it went from the, this glow, which got closer to them, went from basketball size and expanded. In about two minutes, its brilliance dimmed and it disappeared. It's over, he said. We will go now. The doctor said, needless to say, we were all impressed. We had no answer for what we had seen. So I'm not sure what to make of that at all. As I said, it's not really much of that. could be faked in a couple of different ways. And I'm not sure what the value of that is. Uh, he didn't invoke it. It didn't, you know, usually in a lot of voodoo ceremonies, you take the spirit into you, you dance around. Some people, because of this altered state, uh, climb palm trees, do all sorts of strange things, jump around, etc., etc. So, somehow, this was supposed to be a spirit that came there. The fact that it was small and got bigger almost sounds like some pyrotechnic thing. So, it's really hard to say what that is. It's a very strange um, manifestation, but apparently did it at, you know, doing things at will is also not part of the occult sciences. You can't do everything you want. That Can you produce phenomena? Yeah. How often uh, is very difficult, meaning um, they're doing it consistently. Doing it at will is virtually impossible, but nothing can be ruled out. So this was a story that um, 
I need to correct myself here, was related to him by one of his customers who then uh, afterwards, he didn't see this personally, McTeer, this was a person who he was removing some energy from. So after this, obviously, the guy said, well, I want to um, learn occultism from you. He went to the guy who produced this, and, um, and uh, he asked him, are you sure? And the guy said, yes, I believe African witchcraft. Look at the terminology here. It's, again, witchcraft. Uh, is the answer to using the astral and kinetic forces. Now, who speaks like that? Astral and kinetic forces. Those are things that seems to be he added there, and this is his terminology for everything, giving it more of an ESP thing and not a magical thing. And as we've all learned, there's a difference between the psychic, uh, the biophysical, and the spiritual. And... Um, so apparently, um, then there's a lot of jibber-jabber here about the subconscious and other things, and he worked with this guy, and he claims that, you know, by doing that, he's had terrible problems. And it doesn't really make sense what he says here, um, but he claims, of course, that, you know, this was all black magic. But, I mean, again, there's no details here. It doesn't make much sense, but he was able to remove what this guy did to this one. Um, so it goes on with letters from this guy and so forth. It doesn't really talk much of anything, and there's no details here, but uh, McTeer was able to remove the negativity that this guy being, you know, working with this negative witch doctor, which apparently he wasn't. Um, but, you know, he considers all of this ultimately one of the contradictions in this book to be evil and so forth. So... Um, a bunch of little letters from this guy that say a bunch of nothing and really have no value whatsoever. Um, so, and apparently this guy who was in the Navy as well here was um, basically in the Navy hospital and we have to assume he was there because of a mental problem so this is the kind of jumping around this guy does and it's kind of amusing uh, and um, confusing of uh, where he's actually coming from in terms of but he goes into what his what his actual technique is uh, to rid people of all these problems and I, you know that's very very interesting um, one of the things in his particular, um, especially coming from the psychological viewpoint that he is coming from and not really the magical. He's coming, you know, basically what he's saying is that uh, these are mental problems and this is a type of psychiatric treatment. But uh, there is an important part when it comes to any kind of occultism when you work for people, etc. And it's something that we're emphasizing in our rituals to people as well, is that, you know, to be effective in the practice of witchcraft, you must make uh, the person seeking your help believe that you have the power to invoke the astral forces to assist you with their problems. So, it's very important that people believe that, because they're giving, if they give power to, I'm cursed by somebody else, or or those types of problems, or there's some power that is greater that has done this to you, or, or blocking you, or whatever, and that these uh, are blockages that are unsurmountable, then when you go and you do things for people, they won't basically, and this is a common problem, they won't, well, nothing has changed. Well, what do you mean nothing has changed? Well, the point is uh, people expect ridiculous uh, changes in their lives when things are subtle. It's how your life functions from that point on. When you remove these blockages, your life improves, and it improves, improves steadily over time. The problem is, is they believe that the person who cursed them, they give, is much more powerful than the practitioner that removes it. Well, it's very important to understand and they give power to them over the positive things being done. And as and this is where that toxic shit of a mind comes in. This is what the mind tells you to keep you blocked and enslaved. So it's very important that people who go, you go to someone, you need to believe in them. And of course, you should be going to a credible place to begin with. So it's very important, of course, who is that other than the guild? 
Good luck. Some trinket you get on eBay that's got a spirit in it. But, you know, there, there, there are so many different aspects here, but that is an important aspect. And in general, you need to believe in what you're doing, understand the energies that are there, and follow through with it without question. Um, do you question if a doctor gives you an antibiotic? Well, it may or may not work, but the your belief in it really bl makes it work often. And this is becoming an entire huge part of medical science because they failed to cure anybody now you cure yourself because they give you a sugar pill and say that you know this is gonna cure you another important fact that he states that all these witch doctors believed in is that um, one of the common denominators are found is that they all know that there are good and evil forces abroad in the universe and that there is a power up there to whom they turn. So there's a controlling power over good and evil, um, but these forces exist. He goes on to state uh, the um, strange happenings, and particularly in Asia, and where the term uh, melee and amok come from, which uh, are Asian terms for people who go crazy and become possessed. And... Um, a muck literally means a killer is loose, and this comes from uh, apparently Java or Malaysia. And uh, what causes these things? Why is this? Are these pressures? Um, and these people act in a uh, bizarre, possessed, evil energy type way. And it's really unknown what somebody is different between someone cracking or having emotional distress and actually losing it to the point that they seem to be possessed by evil spirits and um, in terms of he talks about this and um, uh, where do people who are having problems other things turn to many of them turn to the witch doctor who understands how demons can penetrate one's mind and body which uh, may be beyond the comprehension of college-trained psychiatrists and physicians. Um, and here we go a little bit confusing again, because uh, I don't, is he talking about this being a real spiritual phenomena or not? He keeps going back and forth. I don't really think he knows himself. Um, and here he goes talking about how... Uh, Witches were persecuted, and of course, you know, witch hunters made a fortune. They would charge a fortune to uh, go from town to town and um, find witches and then go through their um, their little tricks of, of determining who was a witch. And of course, then their assets were taken and divided, and the witch hunter would get a huge salary, if not part of the assets. And the whole people that convicted them, of course, uh, their assets would be uh, provided to them. So, you know, here we go with the money um, aspect of things, um, which is always a big part of superstition and um, uh, persecution of people, um, which is a long and tiresome uh, story uh, throughout history. There's nothing in life um, can be gotten without money. So, um, Money is at the root of everything, ultimately, to make it happen. So if you want to stop all the negativity in this world, you have to stop the bankers because they fund things. Where do you think all these people that have wars in the Middle East, it's very expensive. they got to feed the troops. Guns aren't cheap. Where's that money and ammunition coming from? Um, it costs billions, and it's coming from the bankers who lend them money, then lend the enemy money, and then they make money from both of them, and then they get them involved in the criminal activity that bankers do, and uh, they this is the way the world is ran. So, to get into the McTeer method of what he used to assist people uh, to get into the practical area uh, is very important. He also, interestingly, uh, states that of all the people he's treated, the thousands of them over the years, that not a single one of them was ever an atheist. It's only the people that believe in religion and believe that it is real and that these forces exist that sought out his help, which is quite interesting. 
He also goes here to define what a witch doctor is, and that's the term he uses. It's root men or witch doctor. And again, here we go. Uh, I'm assuming he's got the terminology correctly. Um, we don't really know. Uh, but the name witch doctor applies to one who practices both black and white witchcraft. He can call upon evil forces to do his bidding, uh, for he has made a pact with the devil. Uh, so that's very interesting to note. In exchange for this power, he must also obey Satan's commands. A white witch doctor has the power to remove any spell and uh, cast against anyone uh, can remove any spell cast against anyone by black magic. He never, under any conditions, uses his power to harm anyone. While the white witch doctor prepares his um, hex amulet to remove a black spell, however, if the black witch doctor and his clients persist in their endeavors, the uh, white witch doctor can protect himself is what he's saying here and use forces against him so so what he's doing here is again more confusing well if you're a witch doctor he's saying that um you're dealing with uh, positive and negative forces and you've actually made a deal with the devil then he says that white witch doctors or white magic is different than black there and so forth so again here it's very very confusing of what he actually means and um this pact with the devil is a usual nonsense, which a lot of uh, Christians believe that all occultists do. Um, he also goes on to say there's no distinction in the depth of the belief about witchcraft between white Americans and black Americans. And both of them lying dormant in the recesses of their minds are the inherent genes of their ancestors, believers in supernatural forces. Their environment alone uh, dictates what these forces were and how and by whom they could, could these could be controlled. Um, so here he's going, which I don't agree either, because there's, there's quite a bit difference in the belief between um, how superstitious people are, and we all know that Certain cultures are much more. I wouldn't call Europeans all that superstitious, uh, those Americans from those backgrounds. You certainly find much more of that in all the Latin groups. And, of course, some Europeans are more uh, um, superstitious than others and, um, and so forth. But, um, um, you know, again, he's making gross statements here that don't, always make, don't really make up that much sense here. Uh, an interesting factoid here, if we can believe it, the famous witch trials in Salem, Massachusetts, apparently went on when the governor himself was away fighting Indians, and when he returned, he was appalled by this and put an immediate stop to it. So it was done by some local yokels who were corrupt and uh, moved in to steal the property of um, uh, these people who were accused of witchcraft. And just to give some of the names... Um, of some of the well-known witch doctors uh, were Dr. Buzzard, Eagle, Hawk, and Bug. And these are the people he claimed to have caught in contact with and who helped train him. Um, one other thing that comes out here is, um, uh, is a root is harmless until the doctor says their incantations and puts their force into it to protect and affect the afflicted person. So, generally a root bag is made up. The ingredients which are sewn up in a flannel bag by the doctor are uh, different colors for the many kinds of spells or hexes. And um, so, this is where that bag tradition, when you get into the primitive type bags, unlike the ones that the guild offers, which has the very vast, but they would have a root in there, they'd sold up in different colors. This is the classic way of doing it, and this is talked about in the traditional sorcery course if you want more information on it. Uh, he also talks about a, um, a particular uh, specific thing, and it would be interesting if anybody can try this or actually obtain it. Uh, of course, all these graveyard... Uh, dirts and everything else are, are used in these traditions all the time. The question is, is how do you get this? Not the fact of that, of getting particular dirt, but how do you know if a, a 
person who is buried somewhere uh, was a murderer, a good person, a bad person, etc. It's easy to get graveyard dirt, but there's everybody in there. How does that work? So he says uh, right here, and is a common uh, witchcraft, uh, witchcraft or witch doctor technique. It is generally common, and um, uh, commonly known, and can be revealed without fear. Uh, that dirt from a criminal's grave. Again, how do we find a criminal? placed where a person walks over will bring severe pain to the legs and body of that per person. This may be countered by using the dirt from a preacher's grave. Well, here we go again. How do we find these particular types of graves and where they are? It may be relatively easy to find a preacher because they're well known. How do you go about finding criminals? And of course, in smaller towns and in graveyards, um, I guess people knew who was being buried there and uh, what they were up to. So, of course, that's another thing of, uh, of finding this type of thing. If anyone knows of sources for these types of dirts, uh, do contact me. Um, another practical aspect here is, you know, this chewing of the root which actually you would get a particular magical root and you would chew it while doing something particularly in courtrooms to affect things or while you were trying to affect people in their presence and he says here that all this came from st john's from a woman in st john's island south carolina and she alone knows where to find them so i don't know how she found on a tiny little island somewhere all these magical roots but it sounds very strange to him so um, basically, uh, how he states that the witch, uh, these roots were required the witch doctor to actually chew it while looking at the one it's supposed to take effect on. So that's very interesting. Sounds to me like uh, we don't know. Maybe these roots had uh, subtle uh, psychotropic effects, maybe hallucinatory. Maybe this caused a magical state which you could then project at somebody. Uh, again, there's no. Um, proof of any of this, or as I said, there's no details of it, and he doesn't seem to know nothing about it. So, and it says here, a uh, to cure some of the lesser hexes, a root can be prepared in advance. The color of the flannel will be, uh, will be the controlling factor. I mean, again, they're using this color as a major thing, uh, which, of course, is classic again. After it's made, the witch doctor has to, all has to do is put his force into the root by invoking a spirit to help him. So here we go, and it's the same procedure here. He evokes a spirit. Um, some of the... Um, um, and uh, speaks in this unknown tongue uh, while particularly doing it. Um, and this practice of doing that done for minor things serious things uh, would require much stronger magic the use uh, the use of powders and potions and uh, and other bags especially prepared for the more serious cases um, and this is all part of the very traditional process and again here a lot of this is outlined in the traditional sorcery course which draws much of its information from these uh, witchcraft traditions and he further talks about uh, people burying these different roots and other things in people's yards. And when people walk by and so forth, they felt pains in their legs and all sorts of problems. This is another classic thing uh, commonly done by placing voodoo dolls or other things in people's yards and places where they cross over. And, um, and of course, there are ways of remedying that, especially if you can't find it. It could be anywhere. Um, so... You would then bury a counter formula in your yard, which he talks about here as well. So as the story goes here, uh, this person uh, who went to the witch doctor uh, woke one night uh, with the barking of a dog to see a person leaving his yard. Several days had passed. He'd forgotten about the incident. Then severe cramps in his legs were woke him up at night. He noticed a burning sensation in his feet and legs when he walked in the yard and the vegetable garden uh, was no longer producing. Um, so these are pretty radical effects. It's really hard to say whether this is true or not. It certainly would be fascinating to test these things. He had heard from the old folks that a mixture of salt at, uh, at, uh, 
aphidia, aphidia, uh, mixed with turpentine, put in a tobacco sack and buried in the front porch, under the front porch steps, was a sure antidote to kill any root on his property. He tried this, but the burning and the cramps continued. In fact, they were getting worse. Uh, he had done his best. Now it was time to seek the help of a professional. The doctor listened to the story, and he said, Yes, uh, this was a good thing you did. It slowed down the spell, but it did not kill it, as you found out, um, as you have found out, for several things were left out of your mixture that you put there. Uh, when you mix roots, your hands should never touch the ingredients. That's interesting. That's another little factoid, uh, people who are making this. You should use a silver spoon for this. Otherwise, the spirits go into it, into the roots, and it loses its power. So, uh, you want to use a silver spoon. So, he told the person to sit still and watch him. Uh, I'll give you one that won't fail. The witch doctor turned and went to the, his witchcraft altar. On the table were varied assortments of intriguing pharmacopoeia, bones, dried frogs, dolls made of wax and cloth. There were uh, candles burning, many types of powders. Uh, the client watched strange uh, things happening at the altar as the doctor kept up a continuous conversation in an unknown tongue. Now, I don't know what these strange things were again. We always lack details. I'm assuming that the guy was just putting together mixtures that were some. But here again, we're using this strange communication with spirits. As he selected his powders, a, a mask moved and, um, and smoke bellowed. I'm not sure what that means. The client was impressed. He had um, come to the right man. The doctor prepared two amulets, and when he was through, he gave them to his kind of, bury this one in your yard at 12 o'clock at night and make sure that you have the time right. So here we go at that critical midnight uh, time. Keep this other uh, amulet in your bedroom. Put it under your mattress. Another common thing to do is to place things under your mattress uh, when you're most vulnerable and also when your etheric bodies can access energies better, which is why we tell people to put their bags and stuff with them in bed. Um, the roots that have been buried against you will die. Do as I say. Your troubles are over. You won't have to come back. And he did not come back. He believed it was done. Um, so, these are some interesting um, information of how these practices are actually done and how these things are buried on your yard and other things. And this is nothing new uh, in terms of witchcraft practices to affect others. And uh, again, a lot of this is outlined in the traditional sorcery course. So there's a lot of other things that I can't cover in this particular, um, I've already went too long here, but it's a fascinating book if you read very carefully uh, all the different things in it. But um, he would also uh, state here that in questioning a subject, he told them he was looking in their mind and he would know exactly what they were thinking. I mean, this is very typical of what uh, law enforcement does now with um, lie detectors, which are basically nothing uh, but pieces of garbage, but they freak people out by thinking this machine will look into their head. So he did the same thing by telling them that, and of course also telling them that um, he was this great witch doctor. Uh, he, he states here that, you know, when he questioned his, uh, each witch doctor he, he met throughout the years, yeah, where do you get your power, he would ask, from inheritance and from the spirits, they would uh, uh, state was the answer in each and every case. They were satisfied just to know they had uh, unusual powers. I wanted to know where the power came from and if it could be developed. I found the answer, the brain. So, um, how typically white scientific of him. Before I analyze, um, before I analyze this miracle, I make this statement. I I have never in any way tried to convert anyone to my way of thinking. There is no membership drive by the African witch doctors. Um, the only people I wish to impress and make believers of are those who come to me for help after all their doctors and psychiatrists has failed. Psychic research students and their teachers from many colleges come to my office for lectures 
Uh, I use my age as an excuse for refusing offers to speak to clubs and um, medical groups. The description of the human body is how I... Um, this description of the human body is how I see it. Every person carries his own universe within him as long as he lives. This universe is the human brain, and it, um, and it consists of the conscious and the subconscious. If all the computers known in the world could be assembled into one, it wouldn't work as well as the brain. Uh, this is, of course, um, a typical uh, statement. So... Um, we get back to the fact that he's not talking about spirits. He's talking about everything emanates from your consciousness. You're either direct consciousness or subconsciousness, and everything comes from the brain. He's denying that there are spirits by saying this. And he mouths a lot of very 1970s uh, philosophy here. Each of us has our own aura hovering around us. Science has been able to photograph this. Um, the heart can uh, stop its beating, but you will not. Uh, but you are not clinically dead until the brain dies. When this happens, kinetic force um, uh, has been photographed as it actually leaves the body. So he likes that term, kinetic force, uh, which is mind-based. The brief moment we spend here is only the beginning of the eternal life we spend in the astral world of the universe. Um, how this eternal life will be lived and used is part of the plan that only the supreme force, I'm assuming he thinks God, who controls infinity and all um, therein. So, uh, again here what he's saying is while he's not mouthing Christian philosophy here, he's talking about God and the supreme force. Uh, I'm not sure why he doesn't talk more religious, except for the fact that uh, I think he's trying to sell books to the non-religious or the more metaphysical. He goes on to state here how important the brain is and how it really controls everything, and that's where everything comes from. He believes that people who are prodigies, who have a cold power or anything else, because certain parts of the brain have been activated or electrified, as he likes to say, um, that others normally don't have. And there is a certain truth in all this as well. Why are some people more than others or skilled in general? Why is this? Why do some people are very good at math or sports or have a cold powers and other ones who are dedicated and work hard and train in this common fashion, this book learning, uh, don't reach the level of other ones. So why does one player on a, uh, I say this all the time, on a sports team excel uh, with the same exact coach that everybody else on the team has, yet they do better than everybody else? So what is this and what controls all that? And of course, uh, it appears that the mind or the consciousness connected to the brain has something to do with this. And there are people that claim when they have brain problems from seizures to other things, have these strange abilities, and this has been proven. People that have problems and seizures, uh, while most people are crippled and destroyed by these things, other ones have gotten some interesting abilities from it. Now, he goes on to say that, you know, he's been very successful, and my success in restoring people to normally is in large part due to my ability to make them believe before I begin the removal of the, of the hex and to, um, and to assure them that my concept of the brain and its unlimited powers uh, and that they accept these theories and fully believe it. So basically he explains to them how powerful it is and how the brain uh, and giving them a scientific understanding of what's going on uh, and gets people to believe in his system, and as such, they, he claims to cure them. And then, of course, um, he shows them his altar with all the, uh, I would say with him, would be props, hex dolls, roots, other things there, the mandrake, and how he's controlled all these things. Um, he follows up with all this as well, telling everyone what a great and powerful person he is. Now, we don't really know if he's been successful or not, uh, how many people have um, got back to him and say they're happy, and how many people have not is uh, very difficult to tell in these areas unless proper research has been done. Um, 
You know, why bother to do that? Then he goes into the fact, he says, well, I'm going to give you an ambulance. I'm going to charge this route, which I put my awesome power into, and my power is more powerful than anyone else's, and this will cure you. And then he gives this, he charges this route, um, and that no black magic will be able to affect them because his power is greater. So, as I mentioned, this is a very important uh, part of the process as well. Not the fact that because this is a psychological jibber-jabber nonsense, uh, but because of the fact that um, this is important in the occult reality for people to believe in the process that is going on and to believe in the person who is doing all of this, um, that they are more powerful than the evil that is affecting them. So that is an important thing and an interesting concept here, which um, uh, practitioners in general should take note of. But as a, as a person performing the occult sciences, you should be aware of that as well, is that, you know, you can't, well, um, I'm not a big fan of positive thinking, you have to have a positive attitude and understand what you're doing, and we verify this in the occult sciences through our occult practices, that you're doing valid practices that are powerful, and quite frankly, the rest of the untrained, ignorant, buffoonish world of occultists don't even come close to the power and knowledge that the guild has. These people are delusional, business-based idiots uh, that may have been able to affect you or someone else uh, because you were just wide open. Open. But when a professional comes in and does something who knows what they're doing, there really isn't a contest at all. And of course, the past problems you have are not eradicated, but the infection that is going to continue to happen in your life if you do not get rid of certain things has been stopped and stopped permanently. It's just a matter of repairing all the bad things that happened to you, which you're now able to do because the blockages are removed. So that's very important to understand. He further writes here, and um, I will go back and give you his technique more here of what he states is his technique. But, you know, he states here, the only qualm I have is who will succeed me? There are many, um, there are many, many requirements. You must have the power to make yourself believe. But even more important, you must believe in yourself. Genetically, your cells are should inform you as your brain develops if you have been endowed with special gifts meaning you should know it if so the road if so the road to your future has been cited for you most brains are normal uh, you decide on your future by what you like to do and are best suited for um, law enforcement was for me uh, an inherited occupation. The 57 years I served as a sheriff showed me that there was a vast number of people uh, who could be restored to useful lives, uh, that doctors, ministers, and psychiatrists did not have the training or the time to enter the world of the occult. Now, psychic research is being taught in many colleges, um, many doctors and psychiatrists are becoming interested in witchcraft and in an effect on the human mind. Um, of course, we can see how that's all changed since the 70s, huh? Thanks to the um, evil Christian church who went in and demonized anything that didn't spew their personal level of hatred. Um He states that a Dr. Tory, who is, in my opinion, one of the greatest authorities on witchcraft and witch doctors, believes that there is a place in the medical world for qualified witch doctors. Can you imagine that? Imagine the insurance companies paying witch doctor fees. Where did you get your witch doctor allotment this month? Hey, here's your HMO witch doctor. Um... He wrote in an article, uh, which shows that it was actually published in the American Journal of Orthopsychiatry in 72, states that, the, that an association of Nigerian doctors holds an examination and grants certificates to witch doctors. Um, well, of course, that's in Nigeria. Uh, so the whole idea is that um, um, he believes that there's some psychological effect here, but... Um, 
and that he's had a lot of great ex success, obviously. Now, a great many people have come to me to teach me, uh, to teach them how I perform my cures. So far, none have had the emulation of kinetic force, which I know must, um, must you must have in order to impart it in, into the mind of the one seeking help. I have not given up. They will not have to tell me. I will know. I only hope it will happen soon, which never happened. So basically, he's talking about kinetic force here. He's not talking about spirits. He's not talking about uh, past uh, genetics, which he claims he have, that his mother and grandmother were great mystics. They weren't witches, but they were mediums, I guess, and had uh, psychic abilities as readers, etc. Uh, he keeps using this kinetic force to kind of distance himself, or I don't know if he's trying to impress the readers with that, you know, kinetic. I'm um, surprised he didn't use the word psi, but kinetic was very popular in the 70s as well. Um, and... Um, but as he said, I you know, it seems to me that he's... And he never was able to find somebody with all the contacts he had and all the people that contacted him. He never wrote a course. He never wrote a book on how to do any of this stuff. He claims that these secrets were passed on to him by these people and he could never uh, give them out um, from Dr. Buzzard and other ones because these are trade secrets. So he would never read about it, even though he talks about it doesn't work unless it's, you know, it's very confused here, just like psychiatry and everything else. It doesn't work unless you have kinetic force and you have to be able to have influence to make people believe that what you're doing works. Well, having people accept what you're doing and believe that you are empowered is one thing. But, you know, he's stepping over the line of telling people, well, this works. And I'm sure everybody that came to him that said they didn't get results, uh, all of them were just idiots and didn't. So uh, why would they possibly come back to him? Um now, let me go into his actual technique, which he lays out here, uh, which I want to find the actual paragraph here. So, besides talking to them and telling them all these things about the mind and everything else and how powerful he is, and of course showing him all the amulets, which he will give them, etc., uh, it's important because I think this shows where he's coming from. Uh, of course, he gives them the bag, which he tells them has uh, all these different ingredients in it, and of course uh, he empowers it. Um, Then he goes ahead and he places his hand on the base of their brain where the spinal cord is attached. This is where electric emanations flow through me into a chalice. And there are forces and where our forces are joined. Um, now through other rituals, I seal our force into an amulet. All evil has now been removed and they are free. They will keep the amulet in their possession. I will be uh, a part of their lives to protect them from evil as long as they have it near them. They are told that no black magic is involved, but if anyone uh, tries to use evil forces against them, um, who possesses the amulet, the evil will, will turn on the person who has sent it to them and... Um, and will attack them. Under no circumstances is any medicine given to them or prescribed. Uh, their doctor will take care of their earthly ills. I will remove all evil from them and give them peace of mind. So that's important to understand. This is how he approaches it. And of course, um, he was doing his little thing to protect the doctors there in terms of not giving them. Now, I don't know if any of these people were giving them healing things for their physical body. I mean, these potions which are often drunk by people in a great way to bring magical energy in you um, is by placing uh, glasses of water on your altar. After you do a ritual, you drink that water there because it's now been infused with the magical energies, and this is a great way to do it. So here he goes again is that uh, I don't know if practicing medicine by giving a person a poison who then rejects them from a physical exam to go into the military is practicing medicine. I don't see how that's practicing medicine at all. They weren't curing anything. They were working on a social situation. So I don't quite see how that relates, but he thinks that is and put the guy in jail for that. And these people willingly did it and nobody died. I find that to be a typical white man justice. Um, 
So I think there's a big confusion. I don't think this guy had any power whatsoever. I think under the intimidation of being Mr. Policeman who couldn't gotten rid of like so many appointed officials like judges and other people who you can never seem to get out of office once elected, um, uh, that people dealt with him as they dealt with uh, Hyatt, uh, Harry Middleton Hyatt. I think they told him a lot of stories with a lot of great missing details. And I don't think he had any power whatsoever. I don't think he, what he's talking about here is never alluding to the fact that he had great spirit contact, never alluding to the fact that he was able to um, uh, contact great energies. It all came from his mind and some little abilities he had from uh, grandma and mommy uh, that were basically just people who had some divination abilities and some medianistic abilities. Uh, which almost everybody has, and I don't know how prevalent it was. He certainly doesn't talk about it. Uh, he doesn't allude to religion positively or negatively, ultimately. Um, his wanting to pass on information here be, and couldn't find a psychically powerful enough person, again, says where he's coming from, that this is psychic. He's giving too much credit to psychiatrists, even though saying that you know, this area should be looked into and that witchcraft should be part of medicine. Uh, but again, he's saying it should be not because of the uh, physical curing abilities, but to help uh, basically mentally ill people. Um, and uh, too much of his practice is based on the fact of convincing the person who comes to them that his mojo is much more powerful than anybody else's mojo. His definitions are a little bit confusing. You know, which doctor deals with both and sells the soul to the devil? I think, you know, very much typical like Hyatt is that ultimately these are all a bunch of Satanist people. They're dealing with evil and demonic forces. And um, him as the great white chief uh, with the great brain power given to him by his god uh, is able to overcome the primitive savages. Uh, is what I get. So I don't think this guy had anything. His stories are pathetic at best. There's really nothing here to be talked of of any importance. I don't believe um, the stories here that, that he tells in any of it. His confrontation with Dr. Buzzard and his son being killed was either coincidental or made up. I don't know how much of this can be traced or not. I mean, the problem with doing research and you try and look into the background of what exactly happened and going and searching out records, I mean, you could spend months and months just trying to find out if this Dr. Buzzard's uh, son actually died in a car accident. Do we know that? Um, so all of these things is very, very complicated. And this is where research kind of ends, where you have to um, interpret the information you get from the common sources and you just don't have the time. Uh, to do that. If you do that, you spend your entire life researching one particular area. So while it is fascinating, um, uh, when, what I've tried to gleam out of this is the practices, etc. of what's here and a few minor formulas, but he claims that he could not reveal any of this uh, because of doing that, which is the typical cop-out um, and I'm not sure why he would be afraid to tell people how to remove curses and sharing that information since he feels that this is such a great value and other people should be able to do, it, especially when you're in your 70s ready to croak and he didn't even bother to write it down. Um, so I find that conflicting as well. Uh, so there's an awful lot here, but what what I found, uh, that doesn't make any sense, but what I found very interesting about this book is that he does talk about certain traditions and apparently has read uh, extensively on African religions and practices. He mentions a tip, uh, some, uh, uh, some magical practitioners by name from different tribes. It's all very interesting, uh, but in terms of the actual practical information, uh, what is interesting is that apparently this particular witch doctor tradition uh, around the South Carolina area, uh, the practices were the fact that, which is very typical of, uh, which is not voodoo, which he states was a female um, different tribe that settled around New Orleans. And um, so that, that was very female run while root doctors were basically male. There were some females. Um, 
And like brujos of today, um, they made a hell of a living because people went to them and paid them a good amount of money to get curses and other things off because they had no place to turn. They certainly can't go to your doctor. He'll think you're nuts. Uh, and of course, this is the problem is that all occultists are thought to be nuts anyway. You go there and start telling them uh, that you're being attacked by unknown spirits is that you're a schizophrenic nut job and they put you on medication and if they had their way, they would institutionalize you. And this is extended to the fact of even all the debunkers who consider people who really fight for their, uh, their understanding and to clarify the quantum physical nature of occultism these people are nuts and should be on medications, if not hospitalized, because they are crazy. And I've talked about that before, but that's what debunkers believe, and that's one of their hidden agendas, uh, is to demonize everybody as nutcakes as well. Now, so the fact is, is that this guy, um, in his particular position and came to know this as a police officer and had to deal with these situations of people doing this and got involved because he considered some of these practices. I'm sure there was plenty of it that people were uh, going to the witch doctors, which they do in Africa today. Uh, one of the ways apparently in some African nations which I've heard of is that to cure a woman of age, the witch doctor uh, would then have sex with the girl. And which makes no sense whatsoever, but of course very typical of uh, these oversexed African cultures. Um, and of course all this did was spread more and more AIDS because obviously the witch doctor of AIDS have uh, sex with multiple people and they would think they were cured Then, and this, and this is part of the whole thing. So this is the kind of superstitious things to be treating physical ailments um, that uh, are important. So... Um, so this is where people got involved in because I'm sure people went there who couldn't afford doctors and maybe didn't even believe in medicine you're talking about in the especially older people that um, um, at this particular time in the, you know, the 60s you know, it wasn't too far from 1900 and you know there was Society has jumped up in the last 20, 30 years, but uh, people don't understand how primitive things were in many parts of the countries in the 60s. Uh, and people who were, again, 60 years old in the 60s means they were born in 1870 or something. And you're talking about, what is that, 20 years after the Civil War? So you're, you, you, people don't understand when you look back of doing this. So a lot of people would go there for medical treatments and witch doctors in, the, in Africa would handle that because they were the doctors. Doctors. And I'm assuming they were more medically based in Africa and used, you know, actual herbs and healing things to help people. There's also a talk of in this book and of dietary importance and that the witch doctors would tell people how to eat. Well, that connects again with basic physical health and taking care of people who didn't know what is good and bad to eat and um, would often kill them, just like in some religions who... Uh, don't eat pork. They don't eat pork because most likely a lot of people died from it initially. And then, of course, um, there are things like not eating lobsters and other things because lobsters are sea cockroaches and they eat the what's all left on the sea floor, which is basically they live on shit. So the whole idea is that these things are not seen as um, proper things, particularly in the Jewish tradition. And there are a lot of different religious laws which are just common sense because people died and this was part of the process and pork is known to have if it's not cooked well uh, can kill you with I believe trigonosis but um, or some sort of toxin that gets in you or worms or whatever things is in there so uh, pork is, is the number one food of the world and if it's cooked right, uh, like any a meat, it generally is not a problem. Um, but he talks about this, and there's so many things here, it's very hard to, uh, to really know where he's coming from. It seems to me that this is a big ad for him. Uh, similar to Hyatt, who was a know-nothing pastor, it was his little way of getting uh, his being known for prosperity. Hyatt uh, was involved with uh, the um, folklore people uh, around the world 
and uh, this was his way of getting known, even though he published his own books as well. So even though he talked to all the college people who were involved in folklore, none of them got to publish his books for him. He ended up publishing his own. Um, a major publisher hasn't picked up this person. I don't know who's behind this, iUniverse, um, and who is publishing this now since this man has been dead for many years. I don't know who's involved in this. But certainly this is not a practical text, but there's, uh, there is some interesting information of how things are, are, are practiced. Um, basically, you'd go to a root man, a witch doctor, um, tell him your, uh, your problem. He would then go to his altar, which you would be sitting near. He would then speak in tongues, you could call it, in, uh, as he said, a language that is undeterminable. Nobody knows what it is. And I don't know if that is some African dialect or just some hubba bubba, as I talked about already, which would be a way of calling the spirit, which these practitioners believed resided on the moon, and their practices are highly based around the moon. Another thing that is interesting. And um, they would call the spirits into a relatively nebulous route that was not activated until they did this practice, um, which was then placed in a particular colored bag. And these bags were shaped in different shapes depending on the particular practitioner. It's kind of his signature. So they would make a bag in a particular type of shape, color, and the spirits would come into it. And this would be then given to the client um, one or several uh, generally, people carried it upon themselves, placed it under their bed. Some were dug into the yard and placed on the property because this is an old way. I mean, as we talk about in a traditional sorcery course, you bury things on people's property to continue to send curses to them. And uh, this is the process that was done. So that's basically the entire way to do that. They claim their power came from the witch doctors, from heredity, mommy, daddy, had power. They come from, and you hear this all the time. I come from a fish generation witch. Um, the Westerners do this just as much as any other tradition. They all talk about, well, everybody in my family had the, these abilities, uh, and this, of course, is passed down to me. And there is a validity to that, and I think most people, if they that are pretty magically talented, can can go back and talk about this in their family as uh, someone having these abilities. Um, even in my own family, my mother was very psychic and was capable of, of doing great uh, witchcraft, uh, but never practiced it because of her personal indoctrination. Uh, of this being evil uh, to her great detriment in life and ultimately still couldn't accept that for the brainwashing uh, to the time of her death even the, to be even was very metaphysical but there was always a problem with Christian beliefs coming from a Catholic background so um, which in many ways opens the doors for people because of all this saints and light and candles uh, which drives people into cultism without not having too much problems, um, uh, but on other hands can be quite enslaving because there's a line that a lot of people won't cross from these occult practices into real occult practices. So there is a validity to that to some degree. Now, can these be developed and trained? Well, there's always that natural ability I talk about that cannot be re reproduced. The difference that usually takes makes a person a master and what makes person a good technician and you know with, with proper training and tools you can be a good technician to become a master well there has to be that natural ability and that has to come from somewhere and you may not even know you have it um, but you know uh, you can train at something all your life and become damn good at it can you become a master I don't think you can unless you somehow have that um, what we call stream connection to that. And um, so that's important. The other area that they quote is that they were empowered not only from heredity, but 
by communing, that ability allowed them to contact spirits. The spirits came in and did this and made these things happen. So we get back to the spirit thing, which everybody thinks is so powerful to begin with. But of course, everything you do, every formula you use, um, every candle you light is not something that is psychically dominant alone. All the oils and formulas we make attract spirits. So when you use these, these which are made from natural essential bases, um, these energies attract spirits. So it's all part of this big mix that we talk about. There's the biophysical, the psychic, there is the earth-based energies, and there are the spiritual energies. These all intermix and work with each other. One pulls the other. Um, and uh, that's why quality formulas are so important because if you're using these pure formulas you're not only using a huge amount of earth energies but these attract spirits as well and of course there are there are formulas specifically that come from the witch doctor tradition and i kind of like that term i think i may start using that in the future your van vans classic formula some practitioners only use van van because it attracts spirits again of course this goes with this whole tradition that we i just discussed the other one is vesta again it attracts spirits and some people just do it that way and it's very common in this tradition they did use powders and herbs and all the other things that are shown in the traditional sorcery course and it is traditional and as i said it go these practices are, uh, that uh, are outlined in that course, which is so exciting, which is the reason why we reproduced it and uh, made it available to people, because this is a great record of there and how uh, all these common herbs around you are have been used in magical ways and how they formulate into oils and powders and other things that you use, because it's not just the energy coming from the earth, they're attracting these spirits, and of course, that's exactly what these did. And they did it by, I don't believe they were saying anything uh, important, just like the babbling buffoonish Christians do when they go into the crazy psychotic state. What they're doing is basically, uh, and some of them say that they're bringing the Holy Spirit into them, how interesting spirits they're bringing into them through this uh, psycho babble. It's just a form of trancing out, which allows you to go into a particular state of consciousness. Uh, I'm sure that a brainwave chart could figure out what that is. And uh, this then allows you to commune with and talk to spirits and use their energies at a higher level. So, um, and it's a style. Uh, I mean, the, uh, there are Christian churches that believe the fact that if you're not talking in tongues, you ain't doing the God's work. Uh, others look at that as complete lunacy, but it's quite common. And a lot of people don't like that aspects of churches, but some churches are very um, majorly involved in these processes. And it is part of what they do as well as, and some people may think, well, this is odd, and you got this altar, which we show you how to set up, and you got these spirit things on. Well, what's the difference between having all these statues of saints? And let's not forget all the great Christian practices. It ain't just the Catholics uh, of drinking uh, symbolic blood like the Baptists do, and they don't care. They give you a little glass of it. You're supposed to drink the blood. Yes, we are. We will drink the blood here for Jesus. Yeah. And if you're a Catholic, uh, we will drink the blood and we will eat the body. Come, come. Are you hungry? We have God's flesh to eat. So this is the idiocy of your typical Catholic practices they do up to this day, where they actually bring in... Um, Christ energy into the Eucharist that you then consume. How much pagan can you get? So, really, it's shocking that this still goes on this day and age. But that's okay because you're a Christian. You, know? you ain't none of them funny pagan types, are you? So, the whole idea is that um, um, 
this is the, uh, to take the practicalness out of it, this is confirmed of how these practices are done. It basically confirms the entire traditional sorcery course that we've written to show that how factual it is that here's this guy at the very least, while he may have not have believed in all of this and he was not powerful himself, which is what I believe. I believe this whole thing was a con. And he had information, and he was very well-read. Uh, there are other people who are very well-read, too, but it's not what you read and how much of it you read and how much information you stored in your computer book, your brainy that remembers things. It's how you interpret that information based in your knowledge of that subject matter already. So he stated that he had this huge library of African lore and he picked up a lot of information a lot of names and uh, uh, practices and what were done but he didn't understand what was going on in a cold viewpoint he was looking at this as an archaeologist or as a sociologist I guess you would call it uh, he was studying those societies and was well read and uh, knew their practices and what's important is that uh, he did say how this was done that you're evoking you're actually invoking energy, and you're not evoking it. You're invoking, bringing the energy into your bag, your root, which, of course, is how our bags are made as well. We invoke all sorts of energies uh, into it, what the oils invoke as well. They bring all these energies are invoked into the bag, which houses all these reserves of multiple types of energies, depending, well, all of our bags have multiple uh, except there are some single purpose bags, but you're invoking into this root, and this is these were specific purposes for specific problems, invoking directly that spirit into that and then giving it to some. So you're not evoking it, which is even strange in its own way. I don't know why you technically, and evoking is a terrible term, uh, which is really almost a misnomer. Um, but that's for another lecture. Uh, but that was then done there. The practitioner, who's a professional, was able to do that right there, right in front of the client. And I think that has an impact. And we are doing, we have just started doing some of this, where we make audios uh, for our spirit oils, um, even before I read all this, where we actually uh, perform the ritual for that particular person and the invoking of that spirit into the oil bottle, the formula bottle, and we record that for you. And I think this uh, gives it a much more greater impact to the actual user instead of getting this nebulous thing. And of course, that's what the occult sciences and next level occultism is all about, is making things much more personal, impressive, and potent for the individual, and making the individual part of the process as well in an easy fashion. So we do all the work for you, but you can kind of get into it and understand it by listening to the audio, particularly for that particular product line that we are, the spirit in a bottle. Um, but it's very interesting that that how it is done. Certainly it would be fascinating, and I've heard stories about all these. You know, Dr. Buzzard is very famous. There are a bunch of white people copying him now. Uh, everybody's calling themselves Dr. Buzzard and so many of these things, which uh, I find personally insulting. It's unfortunate that the black community is not leading the charge here that the so-called largest hoodoo organization is run by a Jewish white Satanist. I mean, it's really sad. Um, but this is what happens when uh, you don't really have the literacy. And what happens is the literate blacks coming up, uh, who are generally all Christian and have rejected these things, are not writing any books about it. It's sad that some white Jewish Satanist is writing about it. Uh, and distorting it horribly. And that black people follow the white Jewish Satanists. It's amusing, uh, just as in Germany, the most popular rune books are Idrid Thorson, the Satanist Nazi, thinks he's a Nazi, who translates German books from the 40s and then resells them to the Germans. <laughs> Oh, the world's a funny place, Louis. Pass me the bourbon. 
So the whole idea is that um, all these things are quite, uh, quite amusing in the world that we live in where nothing is as appears and it's another fun day in the hell realm. So needless to say, um, these practices that are talked about here and his lack of writing them down because, you know, people who are dead on top of it, his lack of wanting to pass around positive stuff to teach to each individual how to, how to do this. And of course, the only way you could do it was not have a lineage that is powerful, um, not being able to communicate spirits, but you had to have kinetic ability. You had to have the brain thing activated. Very 70s ESP lab type shit. So the whole, the whole idea is that these types of uh, things uh, really uh, show. And I don't believe this person was serious whatsoever. I mean, he was serious in his studies and it was a hobby, but I don't think he was a practitioner anyway. And I think he discounted it as a white Southern Christian uh, to the realm of uh, superstitious, uh, superstitious, ignorant uh, poor people, them Negroes. So the whole idea is, I really think this, even though he doesn't say that in his book or deliberately, and I'm not sure you could really do that um, in the literary world, like getting into big trouble, unless he was just selling it to other police departments, which there is no really market for that. So um, that was pretty much all you can gain uh, from this particular work. Um, in any practicality, but you know, like everything, you know, if you're a careful researcher and you have an excellent background, such as myself, you can pick out some of these interesting things. It certainly would be a fascinating study to find out if grade yard dirt from a criminal uh, once sprinkled someplace would actually uh, cause physical pain. Uh, so. Um, that certainly would be pretty easy to research and one of those fun things and stuff that's never really been done. And, you know, you hear all these gossip stories and you hear how great uh, a lot of these root men were. Uh, but, and of course they made a lot of money, uh, but they lack a lot of magical empowerments um, when you find out what they're personal history is all about so as i said with the one root doctor he wasn't he didn't put spells on people so that they were ejected from the military uh he may he told them to drink poison so that their bodies reacted now um i think that's a form of alchemistry and i think that's uh, i can give that person a credit of being an occult scientist uh, but it isn't in the pure realm that we would say as a cult scientist, the whole idea is to influence a person to do something in your favor without necessarily pulling a gun on them. You get a lot of yes -um ma'am when you pull a gun on somebody. They tend to do what you tell them. But that isn't necessarily a cult. Even though it is fun. So... It's an interesting uh, book. I believe there's something else he's written, which I am hunting up, and a few people he um, referred to uh, that we are uh, doing further investigation to. But this is an interesting puzzle because there just isn't a lot written. I mean, uh, Marie LeVay, the famous uh, voodoo practitioner, has written a couple of small books. Um, I don't know if she really wrote those or not. Uh, they're accredited to her, and here we go again. Um... But, you know, there's an awful lot of this stuff that tends to be superstition that people believe in uh, when actually they are not generating uh, magical power. They're operating under a system where people believe these things are happening. I believe uh, I recently saw a special on Papa Doc, the guy who was running Haiti for a while, who was heavily involved in voodoo, but apparently he didn't believe in voodoo whatsoever, but he used it as a very powerful tool uh, against the people to control them because he knew that they were into it. And um, I always have a problem with, you know, he was never able to be countered. He had the greatest mojo and nobody else could go over him. Um eventually died uh, because he was a diabetic and not because of anything else and his oppressive son took over for another 15 years after him so we really didn't see as much voodoo doo doo going on there too uh, at least on the other side but we don't know 
you know, again, how much these influences are, are very difficult to say. But he certainly used it uh, to control people because he knew the populace believed in it. And I believe we have a very similar situation with, oh, J. E. McTeer here. So, um, but it's an interesting book. It's interesting that this was going on at this particular time. But if you're in a, um, just as happens even today, and I think probably there must be, um, I don't know what's going on with law enforcement. Ha, ha, ha. What, what is that? Uh, with the Latin communities. Uh, but this is a major part. And all these cartels have been sacrificing people for years. This is well known. There's many cases of it happening, particularly in the 70s and late 70s and 80s, which books were written about, I've read about. And these are common practices uh, that people do, uh, particularly um, to bless and protect themselves in uh, these uh, criminal activities. So I hope everybody's enjoyed that. We're having more book reports. This was a very long one, but there's a lot to go over here. And I think that people need to understand in this particular tradition, uh, which is popular and thought of out there, that here is an insight into it. And I think um, I would recommend people go and get this book. I believe you can get it on Amazon, 50 Years as a Low Country Witch Doctor. How much is it? Eleven ninety-five. Uh, I don't believe it's in Kindle, but um, I would recommend that and read it very suspiciously. But it gives you, if you're interested in voodoo or hoodoo in particular, this gives you some very interesting insights into the bigger picture without being a grimoire, obviously. Um, so I would recommend people reading that. So as I always say, there is no reality the occult scientist creates it question everything believe nothing question all authority trust no one learn it be it do it and let the guild be your guide